if you don't have a strong background in molecular biology, some of the molecular testing modes that we're going to use uh, for clinical testing may be about as clear as this picture. Uh, this short video goes over the key concepts behind molecular biology testing that's used in clinical tests uh, and should help us clear this issue, these issues up. These are the two key concepts that underlie all of the molecular biology testing that we'll be doing in medicine. Uh, we start off with having some sort of a complex sample that we've taken from a patient and we would like to know whether it contains some nucleic acid with a specific sequence or a protein of a particular type. So those are the two questions we'll be addressing with molecular detection. If we're looking for a nucleic acid, we're going to use other nucleic acids. This is because the base pairing between nucleic acids becomes more stable when they have matched anti-parallel complementarity, and we'll talk about what that means. If we're looking for a protein, we're going to use another protein, typically an antibody, one that has been selected already because it can recognize specific proteins. This is what antibodies do. They recognize epitopes. If we tag that antibody, then we can ask if a particular sample, uh, even a very complex clinical sample, has that protein in it. So the fundamental principles, like detects like. If I'm interested in finding a nucleic acid, I'm going to label and use as a probe another nucleic acid. If I'm interested in detecting a protein, I'm going to label and use as a probe another protein, typically an antibody. This slide uses DNA to illustrate the three main principles we need to understand, that of antiparallel, complementarity, and base pairing. So you can see that a strand of DNA, like the red one over here, has a directionality to it. It doesn't really matter what uh, 5' prime and 3' prime mean, they're just the names of the uh, oxygens and the carbons on the sugars in the backbone. The point is there is a directionality. One of them is going 5' prime to 3' prime one direction. The other one is going 5' prime to 3' prime the other direction. That is, they are anti-parallel. Complementarity just refers to the base pairing. G and C like to base pair with each other. A and T like to base pair with each other. When they get together, that makes a more stable uh, duplex structure, like the one shown over here on the right. You can see how they have in formed this intimate complex with one another. That same sort of a complex can be formed if the base pairs don't match. It will almost always be anti-parallel, and it will be more stable if the base pairs do match. Uh, so anti-parallel complementarity uh, makes a more stable duplex structure. Here we have an RNA molecule, and it illustrates the point that nucleic acids hate being single-stranded. They'll do just about anything to avoid being fully single-stranded. So here this RNA molecule, which of course also has this directionality to it, it's going 5' prime to 3' prime that way, 5' prime to 3' prime that way. It doesn't have a duplex molecule that it can form with another molecule, so it forms them internally, making hairpin structures. This tRNA is a champion at forming these kinds of structures. We can see that there's a duplex bit right here between the 5' prime and 3' prime ends of the tRNA. But here's what a real tRNA structure looks like. These guys are forming uh, duplexes, wrapping around one another, and then tertiary structures on top of that. So this is just to illustrate the point that nucleic acids hate being single-stranded. They love to form duplexes. The stability of that duplex will depend on how well the base pairs match when they line with each other in an anti-parallel manner. And we could take advantage of that to, say, uh, ask one nucleic acid molecule to go into a complex clinical sample and tell us whether or not its complement is in that sample. That will be the basis of all the molecular testing that we'll do for nucleic acids. What we're going to do is take all the nucleic acids in a sample and denature them. Uh, this alludes to the fact that if we take the two strands of nucleic acids apart, they are so unlike themselves and they hate that so much that they'll do anything to find another uh, situation where they're in a duplex, even if it means forming a hairpin. So here we've taken uh, nucleic acids apart, so here is a double-stranded molecule that we've taken apart, and we've then uh, returned the conditions to those that will allow hybrids to form between the two molecules, or duplexes to form. 
We call them hybrids because they weren't initially together, but they're searching each other out in this complex mixture. If they succeed, we will form another duplex molecule. Uh, so this is going to be the basis of the search that we'll do in all of our molecular methods, where we'll put in a nucleic acid molecule with a specific sequence, denature all the nucleic acids in a sample, and then ask our probe to go in and find its antiparallel complement like this. Here the probe molecule is in red, and we've asked it to go in uh, to this complex sample and say, is your antiparallel complement present? The antiparallel complement was present in blue, and it was able to sort that out by testing all of the different combinations uh, that were possible. The most stable one persisted at the end of the experiment, and we were able then to uh, say, yes, that probe was able to find its antiparallel complement and form a stable duplex. Here's an example of how we can use this simple sort of annealing-based uh, probe to determine the genotype of a person. In this particular case, we're interested in knowing whether a person has two normal copies of the hemoglobin uh, B gene, whether they have one normal copy uh, and one of the hemoglobin S gene uh, allele, or whether they are uh, homozygous for that mutation in hemoglobin S and therefore have sickle cell disease. We can distinguish all three of those possibilities by taking a sample of DNA from a person, annealing it with two probes. One of them, labeled in blue over here, has is going to be anti-parallel and complementary to the normal version of this hemoglobin B gene. Uh, the other one, labeled in yellow, is going to be anti-parallel and complementary to the hemoglobin S allele, that mutation that gives rise to, uh, to hemoglobin S. If we anneal both of these to the sample, and we just put a little dot of the patient's sample onto a, a piece of paper, uh, something that will stick the DNA to it, if all we get is blue annealing, the yellow one wouldn't anneal, that means we only have the normal version of that gene. If only the yellow probe anneals, that means we only have the hemoglobin S allele and that person has sickle cell disease. If we get both blue and yellow annealing, that means both of those alleles are present in the sample and that person has sickle cell trait. So that's an easy way we can use two probes to go into a complex clinical sample and tell us what the genotype is at a specific locus, just by whether or not they can anneal to the sample. The other fundamental sort of a question we'll have with clinical samples is to ask whether or not a particular protein is present, whether it's modified in some cases, uh, and the amount of that protein in a sample. To answer questions like that, we're going to use antibodies. So we're going to find some animal that made antibodies against the protein we're interested in. Uh, it might be a rabbit, uh, it might be a mouse, uh, some other mammal that makes antibodies against proteins and we will uh, instruct it to make antibodies against the protein that we're interested in. Then we'll take that antibody, so it's got an antibody here that it made that can recognize lysozyme in this case. We're going to conjugate to it some sort of a dye. It might be a fluorescent dye so that we can detect this antibody later, or it might be an enzyme, horseradish peroxidase, for example, that will turn some substrate brown, and we can make that a, a, a stain. The point is this antibody won't bind to just any old protein. It'll only bind to uh, the protein it was directed to bind. In this case, the lysozyme is this little bit down here, it won't recognize other proteins, it'll only bind specifically to that one. So if we have an antibody against the protein we're interested in, we can use it to detect that protein in a complex clinical sample. Here's an example you'll see many times uh, samples like this called immunohistochemistry where, where we've taken a tissue from a person and we've sliced it so that we can see uh, the cells with, within that sample. We're going to stain all of the cells with a dye that makes the DNA blue, so you can see uh, lots of blue background. Uh, but now we're going to put an antibody in. In this particular case, the antibody recognizes a protein called P53. Not all the cells are making lots of P53, uh, so they're all blue, but these ones stay blue because they're not making much P53, 
these ones, you can't even see the blue because they have so much P53 that the brown stain is overwhelming the blue. So you can see a bunch of cells here in a ring uh, that are making lots of P53 protein. We can tell that uh, by staining them with this antibody. This gives us some sense of the structure of a tissue and which cells in it are doing a particular thing we're interested in. In this case, we wanted to know which cells in the tissue were making P53, and this tells us that it's the ones in this ring, uh, in this, in this donut-shaped ring, and then these ones out here, uh, but not these guys down here. So that's an overview of how we can use uh, uh, molecular biology testing methods to analyze clinical samples. The, the key points are like detects detects like. If we're going to look for a nucleic acid with a specific sequence, we use another nucleic acid with the sequence we're interested in. If we're looking for a particular protein, we'll use another protein, uh, usually an antibody, to detect uh, the protein of interest in a, in a clinical sample.